Hello, 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 and welcome to Take Your Pick. I am your host, Chris Puma, and I've assembled a team of hungry, hungry panelists to ask them to pick out some cooking shows. Ooh. Now, Wikipedia define Wikipedia doesn't define cooking shows. They do. It's kind of boring, but they do describe several different kinds of cooking shows. For many people, the instructional cooking show is going to be the first kind of cooking show that comes to mind. But there are there are also lifestyle shows that you know focus on the personal life of the host. We've got cooking shows that are basically also talk shows. We've got competitive cooking shows. We've got reality TV cooking shows. We've got cooking shows that are also travel shows. And we've got documentary cooking shows. So there's a lot to choose from. And actually, I suspect our panelists are going to unearth a few other genres of cooking shows as we go along. And of course, while cooking shows have been a TV staple, Take Your Pick is a show that is broadcast over the internet. And so, of course, we want to think about internet cooking shows, too, because they are very exciting these days. Our panelists are going to take turns picking a cooking show and explaining why they picked it. Once a panelist picks a show, no one else gets to pick it. Whoopsie. And if there's a question about whether or not something counts as a cooking show, well, I'm the moderator. I get to, be, I get to have the final say. I'm very special. We're going to go three rounds, mm -hmm. or let's say three courses, after which we'll all be incredibly hungry. But who are the tastemakers this week? Let me introduce them in the randomly selected order that they will be picking. First up, we've got, enjoying his second breakfast of the day from the Tolkien podcast by the Bywater, Jared Pekacek. I like cuisine. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we've got a writer and an artist with a hundred recipes for gach from the podcast Highly Logical. It's Nicole. Hi. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> then he's ready to mix you up a treat from This Is Your Mixtape. It's Mikey Collins. Hi. I was 28 before I knew that garbanzo beans and chickpeas were the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got a food enthusiast who's always got room at our table, Melissa, Briz Bl Melissa Brizuela. Sorry about that. Hi. Thanks for inviting me on. Oh, I'm super excited to have you here. But as your host, of course, I will be very gracious and I will take the last pick and let all of you have the tastiest morsels. As always, if you are watching this live and you want to comment on any of our panelists' picks, please do. Uh, I can try to make your comments go real big on the screen and we can have you as part of the conversation. That's why we do this live. But first, Jared, what sort of appetizer have you picked out for us? Okay, I was so glad I'm going first because I was very afraid this would get taken. Um, the Great British Bake Off <laughs> is my favorite food-related thing ever. Uh, <laughs> I actually, I've seen all of the seasons that are on Netflix in the U.S. anyway, um, multiple times because I actually just turn it on while I'm doing other stuff. So, like, at least once a month I watch... <laughs> Every season. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'll turn it on and be like, okay, well, this is the one where, oh, they make Florentines and um, Chetna does really well at this one. Um, but only Martha gets the chocolate right with the fork. And, <laughs> and who wins this one? Oh, it's, uh, oh, it's Biscuits. So it's Ian. <laughs> or no, not Ian. Oh my God. I'm already messing up. Um, the other guy whose name I'm forgetting. Richard. It's Richard. I love Richard. Um, yeah, I love it. It's such a pure, relaxing, calming show, even when Paul Hollywood is around. Um, and I think, like a lot of other people, my favorite, favorite, favorite Great British Bake Off content is the season with Nadia. Um, I've seen it, obviously, a lot of times. And every single time I watch it, I choke up at the end when Mary Berry gets all weepy over Nadia winning. Um, yeah, the show is one of my favorite things ever. So. Awesome. Such it's a good so show. so wholesome. Yeah, so wholesome. It's a it's, very good background show. Like, you is. could just have it on and it just improves your mood and, like, makes you look at pretty desserts. And also, yeah, Nadia is the best. And I love her winning. And that was just amazing. So, yeah, good choice. <laughs> so I've only seen one season of the Great British Bake Off, even though Mikey and I both loved it. But uh, it made Mikey too anxious <laughs> to watch more of it because he just loves oh, no. everybody so much. And what if the cake fails, and then he'll feel sad about them? And they have to, even though they're, even though it's so friendly when they you know kick somebody off, well, they you know, help out of the each day, other. They all help, help each other. They're all very sweet. 
it was such a revelation in terms of how these kinds of competitive shows can function as well. Like this idea that you didn't have to have everybody be nasty and mean and you didn't have to pitch fake drama. Mm -hmm. That was really just charming. So anyway, I've loved it, but it's weird to watch it without Michael and it, uh, and he won't watch it because it's too scary. (laughs) (laughs) But like every episode, like I did love the season we watched because it was like every episode was like, you get to see your friends again. And it's like, what are our friends up to? So. And then they all come back at the end for the tea party. Yeah. And get to see their different hair now that nobody's grooming them. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, yeah it's a good one i saw an anecdote on tumblr that um apparently if someone was having like a difficult moment the 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 guests will stand near them and say curse words that are not broadcastable so so that that content is not usable curse words (laughs) or um when it was on the bbc it would be also brand names because the Mm -hmm. bbc can't you know so yeah (laughs) Oh my god, someone's having a difficult moment. Uh, let's go protect them. Let's go stand there and chant, KitchenAid, KitchenAid, KitchenAid. <laughs> oh, excellent. Well, again, if anybody is watching this live and has anything they want to say about the Great British Bake Off, you know, feel free to comment it and we'll bring it into the show. Or, since no one has said anything yet, uh, we will, if you have anything to say about Nicole's first pick, then uh, you can talk about that. Nicole, what is your first pick? Um, my first pick, uh, I didn't expect anybody to pick it anyway, so maybe I didn't need to be second, but, um, it's a deep cut. Uh, it's called Chef School. Uh, it's not the one that recently came out. I know there's another one of the same name, but this is the 2008 Canadian, very low budget television program called Chef School. Um, it's a very lo-fi, uh, kind of like lifestyle sort of cooking show that follows a group of originally 12 students uh, over the course of their two-year program at this Stratford, Ontario cooking school, uh, which is like one of the best in the country, I guess. And uh, it's like if you crossed Top Chef with Degrassi Junior High (laughs) with like, I don't know, it's, 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 it's fantastic. It's, um, you get to see a lot of the behind the scenes of like the cooking industry and the culinary industry that other shows kind of try to hide a little bit. Um, You see chefs being complete assholes to servers. You see um, people's weird competitions and biases. Uh, It's very upfront about all that. And it's just like, it's, it's unlike any cooking show you've ever seen. It's very, It's super fun. And the intro is like the epitome of like a 90s, like, I don't know, like after school special kind of show, but it's a cooking show. It's, 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 it's wild. Um, I've got a little something I screenshot from it. I don't know if that link is going to work, but, um, (laughs) <laughs> it's fun it's a fun show it's, it's, I mean I, I, I was intrigued immediately by low budget Canadian so. <laughs> yeah yeah and like they're trudging through the snow to get to class you know and like there's all this weird drama in the house it's like it's almost like Big Brother as well like it's really just keeping up with the two students or with the 12 students over the course of the two years it's um I don't know if anybody else has seen it. I didn't really think about this part where we're all going to talk about it. <laughs> <Nobody else laughs> no, that's okay. You can you can bring you can bring the 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 cuts mm-hmm. that we haven't seen before. I'm curious because it's a Canadian. Uh, you know, it's from it's, it looks like it's from Food Network Canada, mm-hmm. and I'm curious how much they sort of underlined the Canadianness of it all. Oh, it's it feels very very Canadian. Um, just. But like the people on it are so Canadian, you know, like Tim from Sudbury, Ontario, like the first thing he says in the show is like, I hope I do well, because you know, I, I left my wife back home, I left my dog back home, I had to sell my snowmobile, like, <laughs> it's, oh, wow. it's really, truly <laughs> wholesome CanCon can content. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> All right. So like, me- oh. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. We don't we don't need to know. You you can also sell it to us, which you've done. So Thank you. Thank you. I tried my best. Oh, and actually one of the uh people 
uh, followed on the show, like one of the students, is now very successful, a uh, very successful indigenous uh, uh, chef who was also on season four of Top Chef Canada, which I haven't seen. But apparently he's a contestant who does it really well on that show uh, hmm. years after doing chef school. So uh, it's fun. I have uh, finally got the image ready because it does take me a little while to get them prepped. So here you go. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm more than happy to not have any further context for this one. <laughs> yeah, just really good content throughout. That's um, amazing. Yeah. Well, go, th thank you for that. That's a great show to know about. Uh, going back to the Great British Breakoff for a moment, Kadao in the comments reminds us about the bin incident. <laughs> oh, <laughs> which, my God. which is what happened with oh Ian. Oh, my God. That is the uh, season that we saw. Uh, I'm on the anti Ian side of that, by the way. <laughs> oh, do you want to explain I, the, uh, the bin incident? Okay, so bin gate, it was a whole hashtag that happened. Um, <laughs> in the desserts episode, um, for the showstopper, the final challenge on the show where they have to make this big fancy thing, um, it was baked Alaska. It was the hottest day of the year in England. Um, everybody's ice cream is melting. They're all melting down with it. And Ian, who up to that point in the show has had sort of like anger issues anyway, not like overt ones, but like growling when things go wrong and it kind of like, mm. um, his ice cream gets taken out of the freezer and set on a counter. One of the other contestants does it just to like make room for something. And um, the show, the way it's edited, it looks like it may have been a long time. Um, other articles that have come out afterwards say, no, it actually wasn't that long. It was just really hot. Um, it gets left out. It starts melting. And then he freaks out and throws everything in the garbage can and leaves the tent. And then when he comes back and they do the judging, the judges are like, you know, if you don't give us anything to taste, we can't let you stay. So he's the one who gets kicked out that week. Um, and it turned into this whole thing because, again, the way the show was edited, people thought, well, maybe it had been a really long time. Like, he's he's not at fault here. Um, he he's, he's blameless. Um yeah. And he, I mean, it kind of was, it was more like he just didn't cope with the situation at all. And other people had similar issues and did cope. And yeah, exactly. And that was like, by far, that is so much more high drama than Great British Bake Off typically sees. Oh yeah. <laughs> Nobody ever storms out of the tent. No, oh yeah, God, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, one person with, um, who got very frustrated very easily and and everything went to pieces. Oh, the bin incident. Yeah. Part of our cooking heritage. Okay, Mikey, <laughs> what is the first uh, appetizer that you've got for us? I'm so happy. <laughs> I think the catering show. Okay. Um, if people aren't familiar with this, this is a web series from two uh, Australian comedians. It is uh, a uh, food intolerant and an intolerant foodie. Uh, <laughs> Is how they fill it. Uh, basically, uh, they're both called Kate, hence the catering show. And one of the Kates uh, basically has a very limited uh, food that she can eat because of her largely decorative guts. Mm -hmm. And the other one is sort of playing a character who is um, sort of an intolerant food hipster. Not intolerant, like an intolerable food hipster. <laughs> and uh, it's just this really whip smart extremely funny satire of contemporary food culture, contemporary food television. Um, it has a strongly feminist bent. Uh, it's just, if you've never seen it, uh, I might start with the We Quit Sugar episode, or <laughs> perhaps, or the Fad Diet episode. Um, but yeah, uh, it's basically, what do you think? Like seven or eight minute long episodes, they're all on YouTube. And it's the funniest thing I've ever seen. Um, I think a lot of what I'm going to be bringing to the table in this uh, Take Your Pick are things that are satirical and um, comments, uh, uh, because I like um, like both of the Kates, really. <laughs> I'm not very good in the kitchen. <laughs> they use a lot of like uh, really fun like interstitial cuts. And there's one, for example, where they're trying to, uh, you know, a hand comes from off screen to put a kettle back onto its... Um, little nest and it keeps not getting it right and repositioning it and trying to set the kettle down <laughs> while this like chill sort of da, 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 music plays between the scenes and 
like finally get the kettle set down correctly, and it's this ineptness in the kitchen. <laughs> I feel yes, thank you. Oh god, I love <laughs> these are the cates that that I'd stare at the camera. It's my favorite thing in the world. <laughs> Oh, excellent. So, yes, uh, I also obviously had that on my list, but uh, The Catering Show is a terrific show. Uh, there's, I think, 14 episodes of them. They're all available on YouTube. They're all pretty short. Um, you may not want to start with the episode that's called Yummy Mummy. No. <laughs> no. Which no. is about, uh, they both had kids uh, between the first and second seasons, and it is about cooking a placenta, which they do. <laughs> They're like really, an really it's really very funny. funny. It's very good, but very funny. content warning. <laughs> they're, they're both, they both really don't want to be doing this. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. So they're not enthusiastic cooking the placenta. They're not like really excited about it. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow. They're not. I didn't think you were supposed to cook them. I thought you were just supposed to like nibble. Put them in a smoothie or something. Well, yeah, but like, yeah, that. like not actually. Cook. Not that I've really researched this very much, but <laughs> from my brushes with the. The fringe moms of the internet. <laughs> I think dehydrate it because I feel like I've, I've heard people dehydrating. Yeah, and I, just, them in I know they've treated it like a steak, as I recall. Wow! Just put it in a pan and seared it and oh. browned it a bit. And... I thought you just tried it and ate it. I don't know. <laughs> it's really important. I mean, the this possibilities is with cooking are just so limitless. You know, yeah. it's, it's that's what something. they're showing us. I'm very it's excited a, to watch that. This is a comedy funny. show, and you should not do the things they do. <laughs> I don't know. By saying not to start there, you've ensured that I'm going to start there. <laughs> oh no! no, 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 no. <laughs> totally start there. It's a very good episode. I'm just saying, don't go into it not knowing what's going to be on your screen. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> like yes, said, the, you know, very good point. Celebrate their choice, but don't wish to. <laughs> the the uh, the um, the we quit sugar episode is a safer starting point. <laughs> yes, mm. it's also very good. Uh, or the Thermomix one, I think, is one of the most popular. Yeah. That's also quite good. Um, uh, Melissa, what have you uh, brought out for us to nibble on? So I'm digging in the vaults of my TV watching days back before uh, streaming shows were really popular on the internet. And the first show that I picked is Nigella Bites with host Nigella Lawson. Hmm. I think the show was uh, the late 90s, early 2000s. And I was re-watching episodes of it actually earlier today. And one of the things that I really loved about this show is that she is unashamed to enjoy food. She talks about food like it's something to be enjoyed, but she also, she also presents herself as a, as a person who has a life outside of the kitchen um, and cooks with really simple but great ingredients. And I, I, I was remarking on the, the cinematography of the show, and the food is so much um, a character in this cooking show um, that it, there's almost like a, a sensual effect of the show. So Nigella Bites uh, with host Nigella Lawson. Uh, fantastic. Um, what kind of, uh, so I don't think I've ever watched that one. Did she have a special kind of food that she was making? Um, I don't, I mean, I think it was mostly like, what can you get on the table in 30 minutes when you're home from work? Um, the episodes that I re-reviewed recently, she was cooking with pancetta and making really simple uh, bean and pasta dish. Um, you know, and then in the latter half of the episode, she's making breakfast for her kids. Um, and I realized that I, I refer to some of her cookbooks still to this day. And she, I don't think she presents herself as a, as a professional chef. I don't actually know if she is a professional chef, but she's definitely enthusiastic about food. And when I was thinking about uh, TV presenters and host presenters, um, she was a woman that I, I was thinking to describe her as like a sort, sort of, uh, out of a Rubens painting, like she's, you know, like she's a voluptuous body. She's not afraid to talk about how much food gives her pleasure, but it's also not, it's not necessarily the most important thing that uh, keeps her tied to the kitchen. You know, she, she comes home in the show, she comes home and she prepares a dish and she's like, you put this on for 10 minutes. And so she comes back after this, this little interview and she's in her nightgown. Because it's <laughs> I've got kids. I need to get dinner on the on the table, and then at the end of the episode, she sneaks into the refrigerator because she had made a dessert also in this in this particular episode, and she's just like there with a spoon, just enjoying the food. So I think in terms of uh, seeing 
seeing someone who was unafraid of the sensuality of food was something that I really enjoyed about this. And someone who wasn't necessarily a professional. Uh, that's great. Those are all great things. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. I have very <laughs> sensual feelings about food, even though I can't make it very good. Uh, I like to eat it and I like watching other people eat it. So that sounds great. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess it's my turn. Um, I have to be very careful about what I choose because I know that Michael and I have a lot of the same shows on our lists, but uh, whatever, it's my turn. So I'm going to go with the obvious one. Boop. Uh. <laughs> the French Chef by Julia Child ran for 10 years and 200 plus episodes. And it, in many ways, I mean, it's not the first cooking show. But it is one of the most signal, one of the most watched, one of the most important, and one of the most delightful to even now go back to. And I find it completely frustrating that there doesn't seem to be anything like a complete box set out there or that no no streaming channel is just, you know, Netflix or whatever. Criterion Channel, pick up the French <laughs> chef and let us watch endless amounts of Julia Child being lovely in the kitchen. Julia Child, this immense woman, <laughs> she was like as tall as I am, 6'3 or something ridiculous. And uh, was very awkward, very, but very delightful. Very, very lovely when you, when you got to see her in the episodes where she would go to France and talk French at the, uh, at the market stalls. Mm -hmm. And like, she lived in France for many years and became a professional chef at a, at a fancy French cooking school. And like her French is, I mean, it works <laughs> that way, but oh, it's, it's amazing. But the most important thing, there's two important things with uh, the French chef, with Julia Child. One is that, like a lot of shows, admittedly, but I always feel this more with the French chef. They just rolled, right? It starts and then a half an hour later, it's over and it's one take, or sometimes they would cut for breaks from one room to the other, but it's all done in one take. And there's a wonderful intimacy to that, which I think is one of the things that I really like about certain types of cooking shows is that it's inviting you into the kitchen and creating the space. And especially in these older shows where they weren't so highly edited. Yeah. You just got to be with these people. And Julia Child just was a, a fantastic person to be with. And the other one is that she would make mistakes famously. Hmm. She would make mistakes all the time. And she was just so cool, calm and collected about how she dealt with them. It was like, well, okay, you've dropped your omelet onto the stove. Just put it back on, throw several handfuls of parsley onto it. No one, no one will know the difference. It's going to be <laughs> lovely, right? And that is entirely the right attitude to have towards cooking, but also towards making a TV show and doing anything in, in public and, and living your life. Like as much as you can get away with it, don't worry about it. Just do it. And then if you make a mistake, most likely the people watching you won't know about it. You can still make it wonderful and charming and all that. Just just roll with it. Just just have the confidence of a Julia Child nearly, uh, you know, setting her flambés on fire on, a, on <laughs> national television. So, yes, the French chef. I love her. Yes. You, love you, that attitude. Yes, Chris, you know that was on my list, of course. Um, Julia Child is, like, literally my hero. Like, if asked, I will say Julia Child is my hero because she she is so fearless and she encourages people who are intimidated to enter into like any sphere that they feel like they don't have a place in or it's not for them. It's like, yes, it is for you. Go in there, make mistakes. Don't be afraid. Do it. Like I yeah. love, I love it so much. She's just inspiring in the most delightful way. Mm -hmm. Where can we watch the French chef is well, the question I have. <laughs> there are, there are uh, DVD sets of about 20 odd episodes have been released. Okay. So you can definitely find some on the YouTube. Mm -hmm. If you look, <laughs> usually, I mean, I don't know if that people are actually taking them down, but they're often there. Um, I used oh. to go to have been taken down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the, they usually, if you can find the omelet episode. Yeah. Oh if you, if you, the omelet episode. episode is the best episode in many ways. The lobster episode has a magnificent opening that's completely worth watching as she pulls back the seaweed for this <laughs> enormous lobster, the type that have been fished can, to death. You and, can hear her breathing excitedly into her mic and she's <laughs> moving the seaweed away. And then eventually she just goes, Lobster! lobster. <laughs> We're cooking lobster today on the French chef! <laughs> oh, it's so, so good. It's so it's delightful. So, she's such a force. She's such a force. And so Kadao oh. has a, a note here that uh, yeah. Child was also an intelligence clerk during World War II and invented a shark repellent still used today. Absolutely true. And another thing that's totally worth noticing is that this is her second half, right? She didn't start her cooking show until I think she was well into her 40s or maybe even uh -huh. earlier than that. Yeah. Like, this she, is... She didn't if, start training her chef until she was like 37. 
if you're if you're 30 something and you think okay i'm tapped i will never be of anything important especially anything in the entertainment industry it, there's also a lesson to be learned from mm -hmm. uh from julia child just be as amazing as she is which okay that's tricky <laughs> but you can try you can definitely try I still make her salad nuisoise recipe, <laughs> even though. So this is one of the things I love about her is that she just opens a can of tuna for it. She doesn't oh, yeah. like go get fancy tuna and sear it the way you're supposed to or whatever. I don't know. Uh, yeah. She just opens a can of tuna and like puts it on the plate nicely with the tomatoes and the anchovies and the whatever. And yeah. Just, yeah. Oh yeah. She had no, she had no, uh, I mean, I also love that for many years when the anti butter campaign was on, when people were desperately worried about <laughs> fat, she was like, no, butter is butter's clearly fine. Butter is fine. And guess what? She seems to have been right. So so I, I, I'm proud of her for sticking up for butter at a time when everybody was trying to get you to eat uh, polymers. Um, you need some fat in your diet, Julia. All right. And it might as well uh, be butter. So it's time for round two, which is uh, the main course. And uh, Jared, what are you going to follow up the Great British Bake Off with? So I am clearly picking the most popular things just so that I can get them <laughs> before anybody else does. <laughs> um, uh, salt, fat, acid, heat. Ooh. The Netflix show, it's four parts, one part for each aspect of cooking. Um, it's Sami Nosrat going around the world and learning about salt and fat and acid and heat. Um, and it is completely delightful. Um, I mean, we've talked briefly now about the like the sensual pleasure of food and watching her like eat a taco is kind of transformative in a way because she just eats it she loves the taco and then it makes her cry because it's too spicy and it's like it's a moment that feels very real in a genre that's often kind of curated um yeah like she for salt she goes to japan she helps harvest seaweed to make salt and it's delightful and then she goes to italy and like just eats different vintages of Parmesan cheese and wow. calls it like, you know, it's like candy and like makes focaccia with people. And it's also delightful. And then acid, she goes to Mexico and cooks a Turkey with this little old Mexican lady who like tells her about bitter or uh, sour oranges and um, heat as her cooking with her own mom. And it's, I don't know, it's just so, so sweet and encouraging and nice and i learned a lot actually from watching it um like about salt like i didn't used to put salt in pasta water i do now i don't know <laughs> cancel me i don't know <laughs> no, no no you're literally supposed to do that <laughs> yeah no, now but when i first started cooking like my mom never did it so oh. i was like oh well okay so you just cook it you just cook the pasta but no you put salt in the water um yeah there she is oh. um yeah, it's just watching her enjoy, like really, really enjoy food and not even food that's super um, inaccessible or expensive or fancy. Like she just like eating pork chops or something. She's she's 100 percent there for it. I like the focus on salt, fat, acid and heat yeah. because it's kind of like those flavors that a lot of people don't want in their food or that are tricky and like. Just some of the most delightful food you eat is the food that's like too fatty, too salty, and way too spicy in my case. Yeah, um, well, and she, and she explains like the, the function of yeah. each of those things, like why you need salt, why you need this much salt for this thing and this much salt for this thing, or why mm -hmm. acid is important. And, uh -huh. I have yet to see this, but I know that I would like it. And <laughs> It's so good. Know. It's on my list, but... I mean, I'm just thinking about how one of the, the kitchen revelations I had was like, oh, if you add salt, it just makes the whole food taste more. You don't necessarily even taste the salt. It's just, it brings out all of the flavors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I had that sense when I was a kid at some point of sort of realizing, and I don't know if this is true, but the, the idea that the phrase salt to taste was not salt to the amount that you want, you know, salt to your taste, salt to the amount that your taste enjoys, but salt in order to make it taste like something. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know if that's actually what how that came about, but uh, that was a way of making me think again what Michael just said about what is the function of salt in food? It makes the food taste more like itself. The same idea yes. that a little zest of lemon juice will bring out all the flavors or, you know, things like that. Like, mm -hmm. this, this, this magic that we're not taught, like mm -hmm. the salt in the pasta water. 
not yeah. doing that. Like, so, or maybe you're talking like, about like, it. To do it, but not why you're yeah. doing it. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. why you need fat in some things mm-hmm. to create this specific texture or something like that. Excellent. Salt, fat, acid, heat. All right, Nicole, you had chef school. What else are you going to serve to us? Well, my next choice um, is actually a YouTube channel that I love um, called uh, Emmy Made in Japan. Oh, you! Oh, I did not think that was going to get the light. <laughs> uh, sorry, I did it. Yeah, um, I love Emmy Made in Japan. Uh, I only recently started watching it, but I've wa- I've gone through so many videos. She has like my ideal attitude. Uh, about cooking where she's like really enthusiastic she is very scientific about it um i have a science background and so i love seeing somebody uh cook uh with delight for the food but also with like a very um structured and like methodical uh explanation of it um and she just does wacky recipes that are so much fun to watch. She's so excited about it. She's also very good at describing uh, the flavors and textures of what she's eating. And sometimes you'll watch somebody make something and then they'll eat it and they're like, oh, it's so good. And you're like, okay, cool. But she like really makes you taste it. She's like, this is what it tastes like. It's got this like piquant and it's got this and it's got that. And like, what are the exact textures of it and everything? And um yeah, she's a lot of fun. She's got really wacky, like, vintage recipes, too. Like, she'll make, like, those weird jello salads that were popular in, like, the 70s or 80s or whatever. Um, so she's just a lot of fun, and she's got a ton of content. And she's cool, yeah. <laughs> Love her. <laughs> oh, she's so good. That was very much on my list. Um, mm-hmm. on, I was going to point out my favorite series of hers, which is uh, a series she does called Hard Times, where she looks at oh, yeah. the cooking that people have developed under hard times, under you yeah. know, under impoverished conditions. Looks at um, that uh, using grapefruit peels as steaks. I think was the first episode of it. Which mm-hmm. some of these are recipes that I have seen in cookbooks or heard about, mm-hmm. and just the idea of somebody actually going and cooking. And she's very. Um, thoughtful about it right it doesn't feel like she's doing like poverty tourism necessarily and she really like finds oh yeah actually like this works it's not meant to be like oh this is so gross it's just really like oh this is food let me appreciate it as much as i can and maybe if she doesn't like something she she won't lie about it but Mm -hmm. she will still say okay well i could see why you do this but yeah i'm glad i don't have to maybe but yeah no it's really interesting and it's a really great i think sometimes about that kind of um approach to thinking about the uh, the past right where part of history you know you read you the, the doing of history of, of making these kinds of recipes that you might read about in uh, that people might have been eating under a difficult time period mm-hmm. and is a way of of i don't know communing with the past thinking in a in a different way about what has gone on so Ooh. yeah, it's a great it's a great channel. I I don't watch it as much as I should, but I, I every time I remember it, I'm always happy to go oh, back and check it. Yeah, more. she's a delight. She just gets yeah. so excited about it. And like even if it's something like she had one of those hard times recipes that was like a water pie, I think she called it. And like the in it's it it's like an apple pie, but she uses water instead of apples. I don't even understand how that was accomplished <laughs> but it was fascinating to watch and she's always so excited about the end result even if it doesn't taste great like she'll really go into how she can imagine like somebody enjoying it under a certain context and uh she's very very thoughtful very yeah very thoughtful and very excited I like <laughs> those two qualities very good yeah i also really like how that host goes uh through the whole process of things like she made boba for bubble tea and she yeah. the balls from scratch and you know she walks you through the process and you're right she takes so much delight in, mm-hmm. in the experimentation mm-hmm. yeah it's just like it really it's oh, she's probably one of the more inspiring ones for me because like i don't have this natural knack of like just putting together food but she goes through steps so clearly and doesn't make it seem like it's weird to not know something or how to do something and she's very excited when she finds solutions to problems. So, it, yeah, she's just very inspiring for people who maybe don't know that much about cooking. Very cool. Yeah, everybody go check yeah. it out um, after we're done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Steak. 
<laughs> stay here. You will stay. I want to see the number that I can see of telling us how many viewers we have. I want to see that not go down, but maybe <laughs> go up. Uh, all right, Michael, you had the catering show. Are you going to do another funny show? Uh, well, it it is kind of amusing. Uh, and it's really funny. After I had the catering show, I couldn't remember any specific jokes from it to prove how funny it is. Now I've got hundreds, but the time has passed. Anyways, I can't believe I'm the one to open up this can of worms. <laughs> Go into the VA test kitchen. Mm. Oh, sorry. Uh, we can't avoid it. Uh, I am going to uh, choose Gourmet Makes. Uh, uh, with Claire Saffitz. Uh, yes, our, our idol has feet of clay. Uh, turns out that Kanye Nast is terrible. Uh, anyone who's not extremely online, like I'm sure most of us on the panel are, well, at least at least about half, <laughs> um, uh, might not be aware. But uh, this is uh, part of a YouTube channel that has a lot of different themed shows. And this one, uh, chef, uh, pastry chef uh, Claire Saffitz uh, tries to recreate um, kind of junk foods, uh, sometimes sweet, sometimes savory. So they might do recreating Pop-Tarts. Or they might be recreating um, M Ms or uh, Skittles or um, uh, pizza pockets, whatever. Hot pockets. Yes. Hot pockets. Thank you. Uh, and uh, it's just very, very smartly edited. Uh, very funny. Uh, the host is very charming, very personable, very relatable. She has meltdowns. She loses her patience. Uh, she's a nerd about things. Um, she has great streaks of gray in her hair. <laughs> Not that that's particularly relevant. It's just all part of the package that makes this like a very enjoyable person to spend time with. And one of the reasons why the, the recent controversy where it turns out that a lot of the people in, of color in the kitchen are not getting paid for their appearances on the videos and have been sort of shut out of the various structures of power and mistreated by the higher ups and whatnot. This is a whole thing. Um, it's uh, part, of, part of the reason why that's so even more upsetting than it might otherwise be is that you get the sense that this test kitchen where this show and other shows on the network take place is this wonderful place to work where they're all friends with each other and they're all get along wonderfully. And, you know, if you had asked me six months ago, I would be like, I wish I had a job at the BA test kitchen. Um, so it's kind of disillusioning to learn that uh, it's not so great and that a lot of the best talent there have been treated very poorly and that they have a lot of work to do. However, I have derived a lot of comfort and enjoyment uh, from Gourmet Makes over the last couple of years. And uh, I feel I it has to be on my list. It's, it's one of the cooking shows I've watched most and, and bonded most strongly with. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's on yeah. my list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, it, it's so much fun I've watched a lot of it too and like my favorite is whenever something goes wrong they use that same music that <laughs> sad piano. music and then there's yeah the piano and then everything's black and white and you just see like a flashback to her like fucking it up oh I love that <laughs> I love when shows are totally open about errors and frustration um, yeah, so yeah and especially fun. when you're trying to replicate things that are done in massive industrial uh, kitchens Mm -hmm. at a small scale and like you have to jury rig these solutions you have to get workarounds you have to do really complicated silly things mm -hmm. i mean <laughs> one single zesty dorito has more nacho flavor than a medieval peasant will experience <laughs> in entire life. so like these <laughs> junk foods are scientifically yeah. engineered to be like ridiculous yeah. and when you're trying to recreate them like it's just yeah. this ludicrous project <laughs> It's tilting yeah. up windmills. I love when she makes the stirring robot out of like a drill and a <laughs> yes. and a whisk. And it just like that's like a hundred percent the kind of nonsense I would attempt in my own kitchen and then cause bodily harm to myself. Um, <laughs> so it was fun to see an actual pastry chef attempting to do that. Yes. It made me feel better about my choices <laughs> for sure. Recognize uh -huh. the contributions of Sola to okay, yes, Gourmet absolutely. Makes. Yeah. And, and to every other show. Ev literally movie. everything else. Yeah. Oh, there was that yeah. one episode where um, Claire was making, like, I don't know. She something was making something, and then and Sola wanted to make, like, a casserole out of it. And she, yeah. all day, she was, like, working on this casserole, and then Claire was like, what? What are you talking about? She's like, the casserole I've been making all day. Oh, that was the <laughs> moment that came to my mind when all that came up. Uh, um, yeah, I, mean, I, I do. Thinking, hmm, I sort of get 
Claire's response because she's been focused on her own thing the entire oh, yeah, time. For sure, yeah. But like, sure. Sola mentioned it to you. You can pay attention to Sola. Pay attention to Sola. <laughs> Always yeah. pay attention. To Sola. She's the only one who actually knows how to temper chocolate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're I always mean, asking her to help. Yeah. She, she's clearly just running circles around everyone else skill wise. So she like, made carbonara into a dessert. Why isn't she running Bon Appetit? I know. Uh, she's been also the most delightful when they've all been in isolation. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Her own particular um, going crazy inside the house has been the best to watch. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, we maybe we'll come back to some more PA Test Kitchen later. Uh, Melissa, what else uh, are you offering for us? Yeah, so maybe this isn't a good time to admit, but I only have a very passive Oh, 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 uh oh, uh-oh. you froze up for a second. <laughs> you know, a lot of my um, a lot of my picks are from way back in the day. So the the next show that I picked is called Good Eats. Mm. <laughs> ah. And one of the things that I really loved about this show is that it's part science, it's part history, and it's part cooking show. Um, there is a bit of instruction, but he really breaks down for you what's happening to ingredients, why you should use certain tools. Um, I was reviewing an episode recently that he did talking about eggs, and he goes to an egg processing plant, and he talks to someone who is an inspector. He ends up uh, also talking to someone who is an epidemiologist for the CDC, and they talk about safety of eggs. Um, designer showing you how to make the, the best sort of eggs over easy. Um, it talks about the importance of your pan. Um, yeah, it was, it's a great show. Um, it, I kind of describe it as it's like your typical cooking show meets Bill Nye, the science guy, because he yes. <laughs> kind of breaks it down. So I think, I think um, a lot of the shows that I sort of was reviewing in my mind in terms of the cooking shows that have had the most effect on, on me as a home cook are ones that weren't so prescriptive in the way that they showed you recipes, but gave you toolkits, uh, gave you a deeper understanding of why you should do certain things in the kitchen to allow you to kind of make your own mistakes. Yeah, good eat. Oh, uh, well, there's another one gone. <laughs> um, yeah, no, he did specifically take Bill Nye as inspiration when he was designing the show and Monty Python, as well as as Julia Child or whoever else you want to think of. Uh, it's and, and so you see that in the magnificent props that he builds, which are always one of my favorite things. They, they're just huge and ridiculous and it's great it, and, and and sort of expen- uh, labor intensive and cheap looking at the same time in just the right way and just the right like we're putting on a show everybody kind of thing <laughs> also i have to say like i don't know if you've watched the they they recently uh, rebooted the show for for a season and it was i think even better i think i think i liked the, the newest Al- the newest iteration of alton brown even more than the old stuff even though i like the old stuff perfectly well uh because that show sort of uh, 20 years ago, 1999. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but the new stuff is great. He's been doing some really good YouTube content during the isolation. Um, he's a lot of fun. And I was very I haven't watched any of that. <laughs> oh, it's it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Um, There's time I, in quarantine to binge, so I exactly. get all the recommendations I can get. So. I think it's on Netflix. There's also, um, he did a series, um, not to the show went off the air a couple of years ago and it just came back for a new season last year or maybe the beginning of this year. Who can tell anymore? Before that came up, there was a, a show called Great Eats, a uh, Good Eats Reloaded, where he went back and looked at his old shows and then updated them and like paused the tape and Kate popped up and said, I was completely wrong or i was just this conversation goes on for way too long and it's super boring i apologize but let me show you how i make this recipe now that i've had another 15 years to think about it and cool. that kind of metatextual analysis and going back and making fun of yourself is uh, i'm there for it that's just my scene so yeah alton brown fantastic that, that sounds like the dvd commentary on the internet <laughs> yeah it's basically that it's basically an entire show that is just the dvd commentary it's so good ah awesome. uh, Excellent. Well, all right. I'm going to have to, it's my turn again. Do I finally get to have one? (laughs) Because, oh boy, um, uh, you all are picking my choices. (laughs) And I only prepared so many. Um, Okay. I'm going to go with, I think I can safely go. uh, Yeah, I know which one I'm going to do next. Okay. Sorry. I had to think about it. Let me make myself all big here. And let me tell you about another comedy show. Uh, which I recommend to everyone. Although I've seen people give it a little pushback lately uh, for reasons that I don't agree with. So 
Hmm. Uh, it was a show that, that was made by the BBC uh, in 2003, and it's called Posh Nosh. <laughs> it is eight episodes of 11 minutes each. Uh, so it's very, very bingeable. You can watch them on city, uh, sitting. I think they're all on YouTube uh, currently. And if you, they're not, I don't know how you can see them, but that's certainly where I've always watched them. And it stars Richard E. Grant and Arabella Weir as Simon and Minty, very upper crust people, uh, especially uh, Simon. Uh, Minty kind of just married into it, uh, but she's nominally the host and it's over the top. It's completely like making fun of pretentiousness, uh, making fun of the upper classes uh, and this whole world. Uh, there's a very op- early scene where she's talking about how if you want to make this um, instead of, uh, what is it? It's, it's, um, that doesn't matter, but when you're making this very fancy version of a, of a very, you know, lower class dish of, of, of fish and fish and chips or something, and you're making fancy chips, you'll want to cook the vegetables on your aga, this incredibly high end stove. Mm-hmm. And then she just says, and if you haven't got an aga, <laughs> it just shows you where they're at. And they keep using, one of the things that I love most about this show is that they have, they're really making fun of the vocabulary of uh, intense cooking. And so they, uh, they talk about like, you have to interrogate the lemon, which I think is what they, if I remember correctly, that means zesting. <laughs> um, they're cooked vegetables. They're not peeled. You embarrass the vegetables because <laughs> you're undressing them, right? <laughs> um, after which, instead of boiling them, you annoy them gently. <laughs> and they will often talk about going and getting very particular ingredients. You know, you have to go, oh, you have to go to so-and-so's farm or you have to go get these, this, you know, olives from this particular place in Greece that will only allow you if you know the owner, which of course Simon does because their families go way back. Lady Marchmont is below. You know, it's just completely great, completely over the top. Uh, I just adore it. And it's and and it's very short. <laughs> it's eight episodes. It's 11 minutes each. You can watch that. That's just a um, that's just a, a Watching a it all tonight. Watching mm-hmm. it all tonight. Exactly. <laughs> Take the asparagus and writing it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like there's there can, and as you've now let me know, there is a show about all the weird terminology that the cooking world comes up with for different things. One one that bugs me is like, the dish ate very salty. <laughs> Dishes it eats eat? weird. <laughs> yeah, it eats, it eats a little fatty. Uh, oh, I see what you mean. Okay. Yeah. Oh my god, it's like, you could say it tastes, but no. No, like, you just, you, you, why would you say taste when you can be posh? You say, <laughs> it's a little fat. Yeah. Uh, you create a community uh, by creating your own language, so. That's true, and I'm not saying that they, people shouldn't have, like, terms oh, of art. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, oh, my God. Incredible. Anytime, uh, any excuse to see Richard E. Grant. Of I mean, course, the yeah. only reason to that's see incredible. the most recent Star Wars movie was Richard E. Grant. Oh, my God. Oh right, he was in that, wasn't he? He was. He was. It was I the... so much of it. For... He was the yeah. He's the admiral or whatever. Mm-hmm. He's the yeah. daddy. <sighs> yeah, that was bad. That was bad. It was bad, but he was great. He was. Ah, uh, all right. That is our. Uh, that was our main course. Let's see if we have a little bit of room for dessert. One more treat for everybody. Uh, let's see. After we've feasted on the Great British Bake Off and salt, fat, acid, heat, Jared, what are we gonna top off our meal with? Um. I am going also with YouTube now. Um, this is a channel called Townsend's. I believe it's actually, um, they're like a store or something in on the East Coast of the US. And they sell like replica colonial stuff. But they also have this cooking channel where this guy dressed in colonial guard <laughs> um, <laughs> It cooks food from the 18th century. Um, and it's, I actually, I sort of find him a little irritating actually, which is weird, but I really like historical cooking. I've got a ton of historical cookbooks, like the form of curry from the 14th century or 15th century, whenever it was. And like Mrs. Beaton and all that. Um, but he goes and cooks like boiled puddings or mushroom ketchup or like this weird sauce that's just like sherry boiled down or something like that. Or, or no, it's just, I think it's just hot butter <laughs> with sugar in it. Um, <laughs> they were on some weird shit. Anyway. Um, and it's, it's cool 
to watch him re- recreate these things. Like he does it in an authentic kitchen over a fire when he whisks eggs, he does it with like a bundle of twigs. It's, it's really fascinating to watch, but it's also, I do appreciate that. Um, he will also collaborate with um, black chefs and talk about, well, this is food that was brought here um, against its will, as it were. <laughs> yeah. um, and these are the contributions of indigenous or black people to American cooking. Um, it's not just like white people came and invented nutmeg or whatever. Uh-huh. Um, so it's, it's very, it's like, I, I hesitate almost to recommend something that's all about colonial America, but it's not just about that. It's about uh-huh. the people that have been buried in that history over the years. So very cool. It is. <laughs> That, this, in, this is the guy we're talking about. This is the guy we're talking about. In one episode, he makes a boiled pudding with like raisins in it, and one of the top comments under the video is "Hello, boiled pudding daddy." And I saw that, and I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> "Wow, um, the historical food community has <sighs> sounds like spicy. my community." <laughs> it's so funny. Um, yeah. All right. Oh, that's that's, uh, that's the first one I haven't heard of. So yeah, congratulations. I no, I, I take that back. I hadn't heard of Nicole's uh, Canadian show either. <laughs> mm, yeah. It's the deep cuts that we really need to find in this time of binging so much TV that we're running out of things. <laughs> yeah. I'm not entirely <laughs> sure what this comment is connected to, but that's okay. It's fun anyways. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's Townsend's. Ooh. Interesting. 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 Ooh. Uh, Nicole, you gave us Chef School and Emmy Made in Japan, and what are you going to send us home tasting? Um, I think that I'm going to go with Aaron and Claire, another YouTube channel, um, as my final pick. Um, I was thinking of doing another, uh, because it's dessert round, but, uh, these guys just really embody, uh, everything I've already said that I love about cooking shows. They're super enthusiastic about food uh just love to eat it basically in every episode um Aaron uh makes delicious Korean food uh for his girlfriend they're both Korean and live in Korea and then she eats it and talks about how it's so delicious um it's truly uh it's it's a tour de force um of YouTube channel already. and he's all again he's very relaxed about his cooking style he's in so many videos he's been like don't forget spring onions because it adds flavor but oh i forgot in this video but that's okay because look how good it looks (laughs) and uh yeah they're just adorable to watch and and like korean food is so delicious and watching him make very simple recipes uh that actually feel like you could make them uh at home is super fun to see and and they're just like a delight they use the same music in every single episode as well and it's like this action adventure music that just like really pumps you up to eat some delicious or like eat with your eyes the delicious korean food that they're making um i highly recommend uh just it's such a feel-good experience to watch somebody enthusiastically make food without being too serious about it and then just devour it and look so happy while doing it. It's really, really fun. Yeah. Good stuff. Excellent. All on YouTube. Uh, has anyone else seen Aaron and Claire? No. I'm trying to find a picture that would. Yeah. I could not find uh, a good picture to illustrate with. Um, although I found their channel. I'm trying to remember if I've watched something of theirs just like for some reason, randomly once I, I have. I, they're, they, it's, it's, it's the formula they've nailed down that I think makes them so great. Like literally the same action music every time he's just making really simple, easy Korean dishes. Like he'll have a, an episode that's like six ways to make your instant ramen like better. Uh, And it always looks delicious. And then his girlfriend eats every single thing he makes like, and it's just, (laughs) It makes me jealous, and I love it. It's really good. <laughs> really good. All right. It looks yummy. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, mean, I'm a sucker for noodles, but. 
<laughs> yeah. Literally every episode is just her eating it like that in the second half. And then the first half is very simple cooking. Yeah. Fantastic. Good to know about that. All right, Michael, you gave oh. us the catering show and gourmet makes. What are you going to add to that? Oh my God. You guys have been sniping me left, right and center. Um, <laughs> I'm down to my seventh pick, which I, <laughs> I hope I would not sink so low on my list because while I really enjoyed watching this show, my memory of it is fuzzy and I'm not sure how much detail I can go into, but let's give it a go. Uh, I have a Heston's Feasts, which oh, is a, right. Yeah, you remember that. Uh, that's Heston Blumenthal, who's like a molecular gastronomy guy, like this uh, person, the chef, uh, who like really took like a scientific like approach to food and 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 making these really spectacular in the literal sense of the word uh food creations which might taste good but certainly do crazy things and look crazy and act in unexpected ways so heston's feasts he had a, he had a number of shows but heston's feasts was the one that um sticks most to my mind in each episode he would go to a different historical era so like uh the tudors or ancient rome or something and he would prepare a four course feast uh which he would present to a group of uh, i don't know six or eight british celebrities that were there for basically a dinner party and they they would react to the things but they they were spectacular i wish i could remember some specific things chris maybe you can remember some of the specific things he did but it was like this lavish ridiculous over the top fantasia of like historical food and modern science and British TV celebrities. <laughs> All those things just whirled in a blender. Uh, and it was very entertaining watching and uh, yeah. Um, the end. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that I had totally forgotten about that one is uh, I, that was a lot of fun to watch. I don't know. Has anybody else seen it? No. I haven't, but I just Googled it and found a photo of a recipe that <laughs> was fascinating. Yeah. So Heston Blumenthal is well known for his uh, molecular gastronomy and, um, you know, he's that sort of uh, person. Um, he had a, uh, do you remember the name of his restaurant? The, the braised uh, pig, the roasted pig? I thought duck was like, it's fat duck or something. Uh, something like that. It's in, I believe it's in Bray. Uh Yeah. Uh, the, in terms of recipes from the show, the one that I remember is that um, they did a Christmas episode and he wanted to make recipes involving gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And you can do that. Like gold is edible. There's gold plating and so forth. And one of the two, frankincense and myrrh, he was able to make into a kind of tea. So it was like, so so he decided, but, but myrrh is just nasty. <laughs> it, it's, it's an embalming, like... I don't know, material. And it's just foul. And there was nothing he could do to make this. And he's like, you know, that's his thing is figuring out how to do these things. So I think he ended up making the spoon out of myrrh and wrapping it in the gold foil. And then when you stirred your frankincense tea, it would dissipate. And that was your experience of getting the three wise men in one dish. He also went up to Lapland and got reindeer milk in order to make reindeer ice cream, which is, I guess, very gamey. But wow. that was, you know, there's, so there's high concept cooking and high concept feasts. And then, of course, as Michael said, yeah, you've got the sort of British panel show going on at the table as they all trade bombos about the food. Um, yeah, Very let's see cool. if I can pull up that other image of something that he made. Um, yeah, totally recommend it. He's an interesting, I mean, he's kind of full of himself, but he's an interesting cook as well. Amazing, and that show yeah. had a lot of good stuff. Sorry? I mean, so many. Yeah. So many of them are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm curious with the myrrh, did he try smoking anything with it? I think he did. I mean, it's been like almost 10 years since I watched it. So I don't remember all the details, but. Cause I know that's yeah, like that's the a, obvious thing to do. But. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. I think he tried I'm to make a, a tincture. Uh, it's some sort of cake that you broached open and then stuff bubbles out. Yes. Uh, I'm just, or maybe it's ice cream. I'm not sure. It's, it's very much food that's meant to engage all five of your senses um. and meant make you question what food is. Oh. <laughs> Am I the only one that feels threatened by that last image? No, I, yeah. 
Oh, you're right. It is the fat duck. Yeah. Uh, his One of the things at his restaurant was, was sort of known for was that one of the dishes at least came with basically an iPod and you'd put the headphones on and you'd listen to some specifically written music to go with your food to increase all of the senses. I like, can think of things I'd pay money for that aren't that. <laughs> yeah, wow. but I would try it. I never it's made it up so there. It's so fussy. It's so fussy. It's so over crazy. The top. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's. I it's wouldn't wild. want it every day, but I would want it once or twice in my life. <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent. Heston's feasts, Melissa. You gave us Nigella bites and good eats. So, is there a two word thing that you're going to end us with? <laughs> yeah. So I I'm digging even farther back <laughs> into the vaults. Um, I there were a lot of other shows that I really debated on adding to this list, but I'm gonna go with the show called What's for Dinner that. Uh, premiered, I guess, in 1995 with the host Mary Jo Eustace and Ken Postick. And it was sort of like a sitcom. It was filmed, it looked like in, in a home kitchen. And they had this ambiguous relationship, so you weren't really sure if they were married or partners or, or what. Um, it was a little bit comical, but what I really enjoyed about the show was that from start to finish, they actually cooked in real time. They did recipe recaps, and they also had a, a viewer... Uh, a viewer mail section <laughs> where as an interlude they would actually read fan mail from from the audience when people still wrote in physical letters. Um, I don't know how long the show ran for, but I think for me, 1995 is probably around the time where I was still trying to figure out how to cook on my own. And so watching someone cooking in real time um, with really simple ingredients and accomplishing it within 30 minutes was something that I really took away from this. Um, has anyone seen this show? Like the the host, she kept she was at, at Ken for his his height, and yeah, I think I, I think it was just kind of like a sitcom. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've seen this show, but I'm not sure. That, that screenshot is just so pure 1995. Oh my I god, don't the graphic design. Look at the graphic that. design. They're, they're using Chicago for the font. They're using the old <laughs> Mac system font. <laughs> you can watch episodes on YouTube. And honestly, oh, like, yeah. like the full episode. And then they actually give a mailing address for viewers to write in mail. And she'd have like a, a handwritten note that she'd awesome. read on the refrigerator. But I think Amazing. it also challenged gender roles. Like, I didn't really like the relationship. Like, she was kind of bossy. And I don't know. It, it was a weird dynamic. Um, but I, I, it was. I think it was uh, part of my formative uh, TV watching, food watching. Mm-hmm. So I had to put it on there. It seems great. <laughs> yes. Wow. Okay. So it was. It was. Uh, it was a Canadian cooking show specifically, yes. although it did play elsewhere. Yeah, and one nice. of their inspirations, I'm looking at the Wikipedia thing. I did uh, maybe I blanked out while while you said this, but it was inspired by Home Improvement. Or <laughs> <laughs> was a sitcom? It really was a sitcom. <laughs> so yeah, it was it was about behind quote unquote behind the scenes sitcoms and shows and so forth. Oh, so you have man. a oh wow! But they dropped that idea and they just made it into a thing. Quite entertaining because you know they're making a romantic meal like a surf and turf, and there's all this innuendo that goes back and forth between them. Look like they get along, but they don't look like they mesh in a in a partnered relationship. They weren't. So it was so ambiguous. And in the nineties, I think maybe they couldn't really talk about being openly gay or whatever. And it just yeah, just when you when you go back uh, and look at shows from the nineties with the lens that we have today, I think it's pretty interesting for that reason as well. Amazing. All right. Well, maybe it was the frankincense that was too bitter, and I've got that anecdote slightly. Yeah, frankincense doesn't taste super good, but you can use it for like you can chew it if you want to. Well, if you hate yourself, (laughs) (laughs) none of them were meant to be poisonous. No. (laughs) Oh, what's for dinner? That sounds that sounds wild. That sounds great, and actually, it's a pretty good lead into my final choice. I think. Um, So I'm going to wrap us off. I had the French Chef and Posh Nosh. I'm going to do another. Another 90s show that perhaps only I remember. Uh, it was a show called, and let me type it in here so I can make it pop up, with the very uh, unexciting title of How to Boil Water. Mm-hmm. Now, my kind of show. I had to confirm that this show uh, matched what I remembered of it. I remember being very fond of the show. And I also remembered uh, what it was like. And I looked at the Wikipedia page and apparently it was actually a more complicated story than that. It's one of the original food TV, food network shows. 
Uh, it was originally hosted by Emeril Lagasse and was just meant to be like very basic cooking instructions. But when Emeril got a proper show, so to speak, uh, it took on this other format, which is the version that I remember, which ran for about four years. And it was, here's the setup. Okay. You've got a guy who doesn't know how to cook, who is a stand-up comedian. He since went on to do voice acting and I guess regular acting as well, but I think he's more known for his voice acting. Uh, his name is Shonda Nellen. And then there was a professional chef whose name was Kathy Lowe. He would be hosting the show like you would host a cooking show, making all sorts of jokes. Like you can imagine the style. It's not completely toxic, but it is a little doodly in a way that <laughs> doesn't sit well when I was watching. When I finally was able to find a few episodes on YouTube the other night and was rewatching it, I was like, yeah, this may be. Mm, mm. But he's doing his shtick. And she's there to actually tell him, hey, don't forget to like add the salt. <laughs> and so she's sitting off in the corner and every once in a while is just like not really responding to his jokes. Like he'd make a joke. He tried to engage her in some light banter. She's not a comedian. So she would just go, uh-huh. Yep. Uh-huh. Do you want to show the, do you want to show the role that you're working with? Uh-huh. <laughs> what are the different types of meat on that plate? Uh-huh. <laughs> it's kind of amazing. I mean, what I loved about it. Again, was it was shot in real time. I mean, it was it was broken into segments. It had commercials, but nevertheless, it was very much sort of like one take, and it very much you know things didn't go right, and there was this really interesting chemistry or lack of chemistry between them. But it really felt like, the, in, in some ways, I just want to say this: in some ways, the lack of chemistry made it feel more real, right? Like it really felt like you were in the studio with them. He was trying very hard to be funny. She wasn't being terribly amused by this at all. She just wanted to do the cooking bits. <laughs> no, you know. uh, and and he was like, "All right, I guess I'll do the cooking bits." And he's complaining about like the crew are laughing at what he's doing, and he feels very unsupported right now. <laughs> It was amazing. I was really weirdly fond of it. Uh, and then I remember the final episode with him on it again. He got too good, uh, basically. So he was able to cook complicated things by the end of four years of this. And so they were like, um, we, you, the show is not doing the thing it needs to do anymore. So, so they had a final show with the two of them. And then they brought on a different comedian and a different uh, chef for later seasons, which I never saw because when they said this is our final show, I, I thought it was the final show. <laughs> um, but they showed a clip that went back to the very first episode, which was literally how to make oil in a bag pasta. And it was him like taking the frozen bag and pulling out the pasta, putting it into the boiling water very gingerly with like, and learning about what tongs are for. <laughs> and like, the idea that you go from there to somebody who can competently make something reasonably complex over the course of four years is is a really satisfying art um i don't know if this show holds up it's still a good idea I and mean, honestly i think and honestly one of the things i think about it is that this sort of you're just in the room with them they're talking and doing a thing but it's really just about this space that you're sharing with them it's kind of what i like about things like podcasts and and what are certain types of podcasts anyways and even what we're doing right now is that it's just just people hanging out doing their thing nominally talking about a topic but having a nice time of it yeah i assume I, no one else has saw this <laughs> nope. i could have used a show in the 90s that taught me how to boil water for sure <laughs> um now i've gotten past that point but i'm sure i could learn something from it so. <laughs> I'm really curious to know the, the role that these cooking shows have played in each of your lives because i'm thinking about the shows that i picked and sort of when i stopped watching them I think in the in the mid '90s, getting into the 2000s, there wasn't really a lot of content online, like instructional content, and people still, I think, probably watched a lot more broadcast TV. Whereas now, you can find the tutorials, and it seems like a lot of the newer cooking shows tend to be competition based or lifestyle based. I'm wondering, like, what role do these shows play in your life, or what, what do you get out of them for entertainment? Mm. Hmm. Uh, I think a lot of it for me is what Chris was saying. It's it's hanging out with the personality. Uh, I mean, either all of my picks are basically either, um, you know, this is comedy, this is satire of food culture, or this is like here's here's a person who is a comfortable presence that I want to spend twenty minutes with. <laughs> like, yeah, for for me, it's like the Emmy and. Uh, Aaron and Claire choices. They're both about like me liking to see somebody who uh, is unpretentious about food and doesn't make me feel like I'm an idiot for not knowing something about cooking. 
Uh, so I really like that. And they're just fun people uh, to watch. Uh, with Chef School, I think you really, like it pulls back the curtain on so many things that if you're a fan of like cooking competition shows and, you know, if you're a fan of like fine dining shows, I don't know what 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 I'm referring to, but um, it really pulls back the curtain on a lot of it. You really get a sense of like the problems that happen in kitchens. Uh, it's like, yeah, it's just like a true reality show in Stratford, Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I'm happy with that one. Yeah. yeah for me, some of them are. They're different. They do different things for me. Like the Great British Bake Off is uh, comforting and sweet and non-threatening, <laughs> um, and you just, you can just like have it on. You can pay attention to it. You cannot pay attention to it. It's just like a good thing to have going. Um, whereas other things are more educational. Or there's one on my list that I didn't obviously didn't say, but like Martha Stewart Living. Like I used to watch that with my mom every weekday. Mm-hmm like at 10 o'clock in the morning or whatever, it'd be like, yeah. okay, time to watch her decoupage something and then make Moravian cookies. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, so there's that community aspect of watching them too, or like watching the Great British Bake Off where everybody's talking about it while it's airing. It's like, oh my God, did you see? I can't believe she put salt in that, you know? Yeah. Having a conversation about something, which I don't often get because I tend to watch or read or whatever stuff that nobody else. <laughs> Oh. Uh, yeah, well, except for Tolkien. Um, so yeah, there's the community aspect of some of it as well. And I think that the note about sensuality is also really good because, I mean, one of the things that was impressive to me when I was rewatching that very small number of How to Boil Water episodes are are on YouTube uh, is that the food just looks awful. <laughs> so they like make um, they make egg McMuffins, and it's just a blob of of cheese and, and meat and it doesn't stand on very well to the muffin. Good. I know. Well, that's, they even say that actually. And it's just like, yeah, it's not going to look good. It, that's not the point of this. Um, but, but that sensualness of food, the, you know, food porn kind of stuff is also a, a fantastic component that some of these shows, not all of them, but some of them bring out, but yeah, I think I am mostly in it for the, for that sense of intimacy something I always enjoyed when on the rare occasions when it would show up on network shows and uh, that can be more prevalent now on um on internet shows where where you don't have to be as polished and that's not necessarily what people are looking for and the creators know that mm-hmm. i think we have just enough time to go around and for everyone to say what was on their lists that they were thinking about but didn't actually get to pick or were swiped from them if anybody is still watching live uh and you have something that you want to pick that we didn't talk about um for example the works of Anthony Bourdain. <laughs> I was a little surprised nobody went with. But, I thought, uh, I assumed someone would, yeah. Yeah, I, I did too. But um, but anyway, if there's anything, uh, feel free to drop it in the comments and we'll, we'll bring it up at the end. Uh, let's see. So once again, we've got uh, Jared, who had the Great British Bake Off, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, and Townsend's. What else were you thinking about? Um, so I've got kind of a long list here because I watch a lot of cooking shows um great british bake-off but also great british bake-off master class where mary and paul show you how to make these complicated things um i will one day make an opera cake mm. because of this show um chef's table which i love um taste the nation which just debuted i think this week but it's really good um saw that as he chopped um the big family cooking showdown but only the first season because the second season's garbage. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've got stuff to say. Um, I'm not going to. Nailed it. Um, Martha Stewart Living, um, Mang Chi, and mm. Gourmet Makes. And the French Chef, if I didn't say that already. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, yeah. um, all right, Nicole, you had Chef School, and Emmy Made in Japan, and Aaron and Claire. What else have you been uh, tasting? Well, dreams. Nailed It was also very high on my list. That was going to be a backup. I kind of figured nobody would pick the ones I chose because they're all out of left field, but, um, you know, Nailed It. Um, I've really enjoyed Somebody Feed Phil. It's the one I most relate to. <laughs> uh, cooking on High. Uh, cooked with Cannabis. Uh, Zumbo's Just Desserts. Uh, Top Chef, you know, I've watched it. 
Uh, no reservations, Anthony Bourdain, and uh, Restaurant Impossible. Mm. All right, excellent. Uh, Michael, you had the catering show, Gourmet Makes, and Heston's Feasts. What else have you got on your oh, mind? That, that's a good trio. Um, so in addition to that, I also had from the Bon Appetit Test Kitchen, uh, It's Alive, but I figured, uh, you know, I needed a bit of diversity, so I let that one go. Um, I had Posh Notch as well, um, which is extremely funny. Uh, I had the French chef, obviously, because Julia Child is my hero. Uh, her memoir, by the way, I meant to say this when we were discussing it, very much worth reading about her years in France. Uh, I also had Good Eats with Alton Brown. Uh, and I also had the Great British Break Off. Uh, you can see, like, my, like I said, I didn't have a deep bench. The one thing that no one brought up, so I did note to myself here as our discussion was going that no one had brought up Anthony Bourdain, no one had brought up Martha Stewart. They've both been brought up now. No one brought up Guy Fieri. <laughs> Mm. I had his drive-ins, diners, and dives because I miss diners. This really bothers me about the the quarantine and everything. There's no point getting takeaway from a diner. The entire point is you got to go and sit down there and have the diner experience. And ten or fifteen years ago, he was it was extremely popular to dunk on Guy Fieri because he was he's a very risable figure. But it, like, it's also very classist, and um, he's actually kind of a really awesome dude who like uh, really gives a lot back to communities in need, and is like uh, pro LGBTQ, and like just generally is like, oh, he's actually not some boorish bro. He is a boorish bro, but he's also good. <laughs> And, he's one of the good ones. Uh, good I like ones. how much he uh, loves the memes that people make about him. Yeah. Like he's so about it. That's exactly. really great. And like, I kind of love maximalist American culture in its less toxic forms. And I'm going to say Guy Fieri is that. So yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right, excellent, uh, Melissa. You had Nigella bites, good eats, and what's for dinner? What else was for dinner for you? Also on my list was Iron Chef Japan because everyone needs to know how to make an ice cream out of some weird seafood. <laughs> 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 I also chose The Veggie Table, which was a local show that ran on Omni TV. Because these two hosts, um, Ronica Sajnani and Karen Johnson, who I knew from the Weather Network, but <laughs> it was this duo of women that uh, created vegetarian Indian food. So for me, it was a portal into another world using ingredients I had not yet been exposed to. Um, Christine Cushing Live, and she talked a lot about her Greek heritage and really gave solid techniques for cooking. Um, but she, I think I, from what I took from her show, I take away the philosophy of, about being fearless in the kitchen and that it's okay to make mistakes. Um, also, the, Bob Bloomer's The Surreal Gourmet, oh. all the weird creations that he created. He drove around in a, in a toaster van and would do things like poach fish in, in the dishwasher and make great <laughs> sandwiches in hotels with an iron. Um, and then Chef, Chef at Home by Chef Michael Smith, I think also late 90s, early 2000s, kind of like home style cooking with whatever you have in your fridge from a professional chef. And the, the only pick that's uh, of this decade is, is a YouTube channel. Um, it's called Alex. It's French Guy Cooking. And he just does these interesting deep dives into an ingredient or a technique of cooking. Um, one of the episodes he's, he's released since uh, the pandemic hit was he was craving ramen and like really wanted to have a good hearty bowl of ramen, like not the instant stuff. And so he goes, does this process of making the noodles from scratch, making the broth out of all of the things that he could find in his, in his fridge. So. Excellent. Um, I, excellent, excellent, excellent. I had the French chef posh nosh and how to boil water. Two of those shows are totally worth watching. <laughs> One of them meant a lot to me a long time ago. Um, most of my other things, most of the other things I was thinking about were uh, taken away from me uh, savagely. The catering show, of course. Uh, I did have B.A. Test Kitchen. I didn't really want to pick it necessarily. I probably would have probably would have gone with Gourmet Mix as well of their shows. Um, uh, it's it's or I would pick the it's a live episode, but with Claire hosting because <laughs> that, that so combination good. of direction plus lead is um, uh, we've got. Uh, I also had Emmy made in Japan, uh, and I had Good Eats, and the other two that I had uh, further down on my list are also two YouTube channels. Um, like some people, I went through about a week 
or I was completely obsessed with a channel made here in Toronto called How to Cake It, which is all about making ridiculous showpiece cakes uh, starring Yolanda Gamp. Very good. Got mentioned in a Lindsay Ellis video once, and I felt very seen and validated by it. It was like right after my week of intensely watching this channel. So, uh, oh, it's crazy. Um, and uh, another one with this very similar name called How to Cook That, which is based out of Australia. And the big thing about that show, the, the most interesting episodes of it are where she debunks things like uh, life hacks and, and other things like don't actually do this. This will not work. Uh, she also has a, a fun thing where um, she looks at various kitchen gadgets that are ridiculous and decides whether they are clever or never. Uh, and, and similarly like to, uh, I think it was the, um, I think it was uh, Nicole's uh, choice of Aaron and uh, da, 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 Claire. Um, she also will often make her husband, like if she does a thing that needs to be debunked, like this will not actually make scrambled eggs in the microwave super easy. She will make her husband eat the scrambled egg disaster. And he's very good at, bravely putting that st putting that spoon into his mouth <laughs> so that's all we can ask for uh we've got a few uh viewer comments here uh could i also wanted to put in a word for nailed it mm -hmm. it is self-awarely and indulgently shambolic and always sweet and gentle about mocking the inevitable failures of its contestants also nicole Byer is a queen true yes mm -hmm. <laughs> that's oh, yeah. all good I, I i haven't watched it but that all sounds excellent oh. i approve Oh, it's it's so wholesome. It feels so good to watch it. Um, I like that it's a show with the premise. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like that it's a show with the premise that, like, you know, you're going to do badly. Uh, I, I just like that. I, I think there should be more competition shows where people are expected to do very badly um, <laughs> and treated kindly, even when they make mistakes. <laughs> Yes, and Angela says, of course, nothing but respect for the mayor of Flavortown, Guy Fieri. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, great. Um, well, I think we're about done here. I think we all agreed that cooking shows are delightful and intimate mm -hmm. and are often at their best when people are flailing and failing mm -hmm. and giving us the confidence to flail and fail in the kindest ways possible. <laughs> so I would like to thank all of our panelists, Jared, Nicole, Michael, Melissa, and me. <laughs> and I'd thank like to thank you. everybody uh, for watching. We will be back next time, next week, with another panel, doing another set of picks. But until then, uh, bye. Bye. Who's hungry? I'm gonna make <laughs> I'm gonna make craft dinner. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>